Welcome and good morning to those in the Americas and good afternoon to those in Europe. I'm Susana Arellano, Sustainable Urban Development Expert of the IURC North America program. And I'm connecting today from New York in the US. Where are you connecting from? Please tell us in the chat. Thank you for joining us for the second webinar of our Sustainable Urban Transport and Mobility Series. These webinars are part of the International Urban and Regional Cooperation Program. In this session, we will learn what low emission zones are, what can make them more successful, and we will hear directly from the metropolitan area of Barcelona about how they have implemented theirs. And for those cities considering alternatives to the low emission zones and starting to think how to replicate what we're seeing in Europe, you will learn about the zero emission delivery zones, which are starting to appear also in the US. If you have any questions at any point during the presentations, feel free to add them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will also be glad to hear your question out loud. So if you would like to speak, please raise your hand and we will enable your microphone. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be available to all attendees. I would like to give the floor now to Ana Guayarte, our program manager at the IURC North of the IURC North America program at the EU delegation in Canada for some opening remarks. Ana. Thank you very much, uh, Susana, and uh, well, welcome to all participants and the speakers. Uh, as Susana said, uh, I am, uh, my name is Ana Guayarte. I'm based in Ottawa and I'm representing today here the European Union that is supporting the International Urban Regional Cooperation Program, uh, IORC, as uh, you know it more. Uh, IORC is a global program that works in uh, Europe, Asia, and the Americas. And uh, this is a, a part of, of it, a component that is working in North America, United States, Canada, and the European Union. And it is really very interesting and successful, so we are very happy with what is happening. And this is the second webinar in a series of webinars dedicated to urban, sustainable urban mobility and transport. And uh, I think it's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, the experts uh, that have been uh, uh, invited are uh, I can't really, uh, I think they are very, very, very uh, interesting. And it's good that uh, it will be recorded and the cities will be able to, to use it uh, and to, to listen. They will be available in the web, I, I guess. Uh, Susana, please correct me otherwise. So I invite you to visit the, the web of IURC to know more about the global program and also the components in North America and all the all the, the, the material that is being posted there. So uh, thank you very much to Jordi, Hamilton, Jacob and Lydia for uh, being here today and uh, for sharing your uh, knowledge and expertise in this very uh, key topic. And uh, without a further delay, I, I pass the floor over to you, Susana, to, to start the, the, the webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And yes, as you mentioned, we are having all of the recordings in our website. At the end of the session, Callum will share with you in the chat the link to uh, the page where we're putting all the recordings and where you will find more about future sessions. And now I would like to start with um, Jacob. So we will have an introduction of how um, low emission zones. Um, okay, again, because I got a little bit overwhelmed. Okay, Jacob Mason, who is the Director of Research and Impact at the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, will talk about an introduction to low emission zones. And that's based on a report that they have been working on and released in February which is the Opportunity of Low Emission Zones, a Taming Traffic Deep Dive Report, which give us a background to understand the potential of low emission zones in your city. Jacob will share with us some of the insights from the report, but I highly recommend that you read the full one. So we are gonna be sharing the link in the chat so that you can take a look at the full thing. So Jacob, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Susanna. Uh, hope you can hear me. Um, as Susanna mentioned, I'm Jacob Mason at the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. For those of you who don't know us, we're an NGO that works in cities around the world, working on making cities better for, for walking, cycling, public transport, and for people in general. So cleaner air, um, safer streets, uh, healthier cities. So um, as Susanna mentioned, we did a report looking at low emission zones and the opportunity that they present in the cities around the world, a number of the cities that we work with directly with our locally staffed offices, 
um, which are primarily in low and middle income countries, uh, have been pursuing uh, low emission zones. And so we've been working with the governments there on how to think about these, um, how to plan them to be, to take the most, uh, make the most of the opportunity that they present to make cities better. So we compiled that information into a report, um, this report. Um, and so just to start, um, first I want to talk about what a low emission zone is. Um, and looking through this, we've really found two key components. Um, low emission zones restrict the use of polluting vehicles. So they, um, they make fewer polluting vehicles go into an area or charge money for them or uh, have some sort of restriction. Um, and they exist as a continuous zone. So in a whole area that has a restriction, not just a street, not just a, a, like a parking area, like a whole zone. Um, the size of those zones we'll talk about in just a sec. Um, so low emission zones can apply to either just passenger vehicles, heavy duty freight vehicles. Some of the first ones started off with freight vehicle restrictions, but now a lot of them um, include passenger vehicles as well. Um, low emission zones can charge uh, a price for entering them if you don't meet the uh, requirements, uh, the emissions requirements, you may be able to pay a price to enter, or they might not be priced and you're simply uh, restrictions, there's bans on which vehicles can enter and non-compliant vehicles can be fined if you go in, um, if you don't meet the requirements. Um, based on our de definition, the low emission zone is not just a corridor. Um, and it's not just a, a street that doesn't explicitly restrict vehicles. So there are some instances where um, there are more of a positive incentive that like encourages um, the use of less emitting vehicles, but it's slightly, it's a different, um, something different than a, a low emission zones the way we, we see it. Um, we did try to make a, a definition that's pretty broad so that people understand uh, what we mean, but also that's inclusive of a lot of different aspects of low emission zones that get to the goal of um, improving air quality as the, the prior, primary goal of low emission zones. So one thing we did want to highlight is that car free and car restricted zones are low emission zones. Sometimes this gets left out. Um, if it's a, a big area that restricts uh, uh, vehicles from entering, that can very much be uh, an encouragement for lower emissions transportation. Um, and so this is a, a, a nice car-free area that is has a lot of zero emission transportation happening. Um, you can see people cycling and walking. Um, low emission zones have a lot of different shapes and forms, how they're operated, how they're priced, how big they are. Um, as you can see, you know, the one in Brussels is um, almost 10 times the one in Seoul, um, but that all can have very strong impacts. It really depends on the context in each location and the um, setup of the low emission zones. So there's no, there's no magic sauce. It very much is dependent on the location and the, the details and how it's done. Um, this one is in um, Brussels. And you can see that the, the size is big enough that it really covers almost the, the whole of the central city. Um, with the low emission zones. Um, but really the big opportunity, um, in addition to reducing emissions, um, it can jumpstart, low emission zones can jumpstart the electrification of vehicles. They can also catalyze, they can build momentum and align efforts to improve walking, cycling, and public transportation and improve access for the city in general. And that's a uh, the combination of these is why what gets um, ITDP excited about low emission zones as an opportunity. Um, and we have seen uh, really notable impacts of low emission zones in London in the first 10 months. Um, nitrous oxide emissions were down 44%. Um, PM 2.5 was down 27%. Um, similar results in Seoul and Antwerp both saw big reductions in particulate matter emissions. Um, and also um, uh, London and Seoul both reported really strong reductions in, in driving in those areas. So they can have really big impacts. 
But in terms of design, you know, equity is a big part of making sure that low emission zones um, are successful. Um, changes to the urban environment, um, especially more punitive and restrictive ones, can have some of the biggest impacts on lower income uh, residents um, who have the, the fewest alternatives. And so making sure that the designs have the most benefit for those who are most vulnerable uh, can be really important. Making sure that you have good alternatives. So if you're introducing restrictions on driving, making sure that there are good affordable alternatives to those, um, perhaps providing incentives for uh, meeting the um, requirements of the low emission zones. So some places have introduced incentives for things like e-bikes or um, improvements to vehicles. Um, also designing so that the low emission zones target the areas that are most impacted by heavy emissions can be a really important way to uh, bring equity into the design. Um, in addition to the low emission zone itself, there are lots of ways to improve cities uh, alongside that. There are lots of um, policies that go along well that complement low emission zones, such as redesigning streets to provide better non-driving alternatives, such as walking, cycling, um, improvements to public transport, subsidies, so reduced fares for public transport. Um, there have also been incentives for uh, improving uh, the vehicle technology, so uh, scrappage incentives um, and uh, e-bike purchase incentives. Um, there have also been uh, incentives to improve land use, to create more destinations, more mixture of uses in areas so that there are more destinations within a short distance of where people live. This makes it easier to get around to those places by walking and cycling uh, and modes that don't uh, generate any pollution. And then finally, you can introduce uh, stricter subzones um, within a low emission zone. So some really core central areas have introduced zero emission areas um, in the very highest demand areas to uh, further restrict uh, vehicle use in those areas and uh, incentivize uh, cleaner transportation. So the way we think about it really, you know, the first thing when planning a low emission zone is to consider the context, what is transportation like, um, how big would a low emission zone need to be in order to be effective so people don't just go around it. Um, and where are the big problems with pollution that you're trying to address? And then um, the design of the system uh, is really should flow from that. And then you can also include the other strategic um, uh, components that go alongside and complement low emission zones, such as improvements to public transport, discounts. Um, and really the goal should be to create a, a low emission zone that really improves um, multiple aspects of, of the city's transportation system at the same time, improving air quality while also um, improving access and maintaining equity. Uh, not all of the policies require the same amount of capacity. Some of the things such as street designs may require less technical knowledge, whereas things like stricter subzones where you have to have really detailed enforcement uh, in multiple locations can require much more technical capacity. So we tried to um, separate these out and show which things are easier and more complicated so that cities can match their, uh, their policy tools with their uh, own capacity. And I should also mention that the um, more blunt tools, such as just bans, uh, require less capacity than um, really uh, nuanced um, uh, emission uh, levels. So if you have uh, strict, um, you have to codify exactly existing emission standards within your vehicles and then have a really good enforcement regime in order to implement a, a more of a priced um, or emission-based uh, low emission zone. So um, car-free areas are much easier and require less technical capacity to implement than a more nuanced low emission zone. Um, and just really quickly, I know I'm getting to end the the lessons that we have found in reviewing low emission zones is that, you know, the size really does matter and how well enforced the zones are can be really important. Um, but by doing those well, you can um, really improve air quality in with a low emission zone.
Um, revenue generation is a big pitfall in a lot of uh, policy schemes. People go for the money. And if you're making the money the top priority, you often miss out on the other goals of uh, the policy, such as reducing emissions, improving access. And then finally, though, if it is large enough and well enforced, it really can, low emission zones can uh, encourage the uptake of low and zero emission vehicles and encourage um, cleaner transportation. So I'll stop there. This is the report and uh, a quick link to it. I know it's going to be circulated separately. So um, happy to follow up with any questions by email, or you can go to our website and contact us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Jacob. That was a great um, kind of very quick overview of what the report offers. I don't know if anyone in the audience has uh, questions. If you would like to ask it out loud, we would love to hear you and enable your microphone. If not, please add it in the Q&A box. Um, in the meantime, Jacob, I would like to ask you if, so we see that most of these low emission zones have started in Europe, and now we're seeing that they are being replicated in other places. What would be the first step that you would tell um, cities from other geographical areas, which we have in the audience, um, to start thinking about implementing a low emission zone in their city? Yeah. Um... You know, as I mentioned in the in the presentation, I think understanding what the, the specific challenges and goals you have for your city, um, where are pollution levels really high? Where do you have lots of alternatives for transportation? Um, if you have good access by public transportation, walking, cycling, that might be a good place to to think about for a low emission zone. And where are the places that have um, where there's a real equity concern? Um, where there's low income areas that do have really high levels of pollution would be a good area to think about. Um, so I think that would be the starting area. And then the last thing would be just what are the capacities of your city to implement new policies that, that can be challenging. For sure, we have been hearing a lot from the US and Canadian cities in terms of policy and how these can be very challenging, um, even if as um, the city itself tries to implement it, there are many other policies at other levels that would not allow um, this type of ban. Or for example, what you said, it's easier to just do a ban versus um, analyzing just the emissions and being a little bit um, more nuanced or with more rules. But sometimes that could help in terms of policy. So I don't see any questions for now. So I will continue with the next presentation and then we can have a discussion amongst all panelists. Um, so now I would like to present the case from Metropolitan Area of Barcelona. So I welcome Jordi Jove Palau, Project Manager of Low Emission Zones and Regulated Parking at AMB. Jordi. Thank you, Susana. Let me share my screen. So hope you can see it. Um, as Susana said, I'm Jordi from Barcelona Metropolitan Area. I'm project manager for low emission zones. Um, I will start with a brief introduction of the Barcelona Metropolitan Area. Then I will follow with uh, our motivations and the implementation of our low emission zones. Uh, after that, I will talk about the achievements uh, we get. And finally, uh, I will face the challenges. Uh, the Barcelona Metropolitan Area is the public administration of the Metropolitan Area of Barcelona. We represent uh, 36 municipalities with more than 3.2 uh, 3 uh, in million inhabitants uh, in an area, and it is in an area of uh, more than 600 square kilometers. Uh, why uh, we decided to implement the low emission zones? Well, we decided it because the metropolitan area of Barcelona exceeded uh, the concentration uh, limits uh, of some pollutants, especially um, uh, some <clears throat> the nitro the oxides of nitrogen and uh, <clears throat> particles. <clears throat> In the case of the city of Barcelona, that is the most, the most 
the big one, uh, 70 percent of the population was exposed to those uh, high levels of pollutants uh, behind the those recommended by the World Health Organization and also the, the, the Union, uh, the European Union. Uh, then uh, we decided that we should implement low emission zones uh, to solve that pollution problems, and we started with the low emission zones of what we call uh, Barcelona Ring, that includes the city of Barcelona and the surrounding cities of uh, Cornellà, Esplugas, El Llobregat, uh, San Adrià, and uh, L'Hospital El Llobregat. Uh, and that was in 2020. Uh, then we later implemented the low emission zones of uh, San Juan de Esti and San Cugat del Valles to other cities in 2021. And this early 2023, we added uh, the Badalona city. The low emission zones is permanently from Monday to Friday from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And only non continuing uh, vehicles can drive in the low emission zones area. Uh, here in Spain, we have a, a series of uh, contamination stickers for uh, each uh, kind of uh, vehicle. Uh, mainly is, uh, are uh, the, the yellow one or, um, or letter B, that's for a diesel, more or less. Uh, the green one or letter C for uh, gasoline the green and blue uh, or echo for those hybrids and the zero or, or dark blue for the electric ones. Only the, the, the vehicles with this, uh, one of these stickers can drive in the low emission zones. Uh, the low emission zones is for all kinds of vehicles, uh, motorcycles, uh, cars, vans, uh, little trucks, uh, trucks and buses. Um, and we implemented uh, in different phases involving first uh, motorcycles and cars, later little vans, uh, and finally buses and uh, big, uh, big trucks. When we decided to implement the low emission zones, uh, we think about uh, that we should offer our citizens a different alternative and also be uh, a public administration example. That's why we offer free transfer for those owners that uh, was going to scrapping a uh, pollutant vehicle. That means uh, scrapping a vehicle without uh, an environmental sticker. We also improved the public transport in terms of uh, coverage and frequency. So uh, we implemented some what we call Metrobus lines that was uh, services of a uh, high frequency and also implemented express bus lines that our services uh, with high, high speed uh, service. We also bet on sustainable mobility models. We implemented what we call uh, BCBS uh, network, that it's an, a network of uh, bike lanes connecting the different municipalities because we uh, realized that there was a lack of connection between uh, each municipality. And we also started an environmental and environmentalization of our fleet, uh, incorporating uh, different uh, buses, mainly hybrid and 100% uh, electric ones. Uh, thanks uh, to all of this, we achieved a reduction of the pollution. So during the period of the implementation of the low emission zones, um, we pass uh, from having 20% uh, of the circulating vehicles without um, environmental sticker to have only a 2% of the circulating vehicles with a, a non-environmental uh, sticker. That's a, a high reduction of the number of pollution uh, vehicles. We also reduced uh, the different pollutants. Uh, the most important uh, reduction was uh, more than a 50% in the reduction of the NOx pollutants and around 20% of the PM10 particles. But you can see that we also reduced uh, the smallest more particles of PM2.5. We also reduced around 30% of black carbon. 
and uh, the reduction of uh, CO2 was was uh, was fewer because was not is not a a, a pollutant that uh, was a relationship with this uh, measure of the low emission zones. We also uh, discovered that we uh, really um, had an early uh, renovation of uh, the fleet. If you can see on, on the left in, in red, there is the Spanish um, average uh, age of vehicles that is around 12 uh, years old. Uh, uh, and on the right in green, we have the average age for each year of the vehicles in Barcelona that is around 10 and 11. So we have more younger vehicles than the average in Spain. And then uh, what we, what uh, we, I just, um, I'm going to talk about a few of the main challenges that we face it uh, for the implementation, but I think that they are the most interesting ones. Uh, the first one was the political uh, challenge. Uh, we were able to implement this low emission zone. Uh, the first one in the Barcelona area, um, thanks to a political agreement between the municipalities uh, government the metropolitan government and also the regional government. Also, this agreement was not only in a short time for the implementation of these specific low emission zones, it was also an agreement uh, with a mid and long term uh, <clears throat> plan to implement a low emission zones in the old uh, metropolitan area and uh, maybe all the metropolitan region. The other challenge was the social one. Uh, citizens were not uh, friendly uh, with this uh, measure of the low emission zones. So uh, we work at it in two ways. Uh, the first one was a previous communication campaign and uh, relating, relating the uh, implementation of the low emission zones with uh, the health problems and pollution problems. Uh, we we will we started the communications around 2017, uh, and when we had the <clears throat> the implementation date on 2020. So in three years before, we started talking about the the pollution problems uh, facing the metropolitan area and the Barcelona city, uh, in order to prepare our citizens uh, for future measures. Uh, then we, when we implemented the low emission zones, we uh, opened different working groups with different uh, social representatives, uh, mainly uh, from professionals and also from different citizen representations. And we established a number of uh, authorizations and exemptions uh, to uh, still drive in the low emission zones with pollutant vehicles. So we have uh, on the one side uh, uh, exemptions for those people on low incomes, that is for families with uh, uh, low budgets. Uh, we also establish uh, daily permits for everyone. Everybody can uh, ask for a daily permit on up to 24 per year in a tax about uh, seven euros. <clears throat> we also established different authorizations and exemptions on health uh, uh, situations. Uh, we have exemptions for those uh, with medical uh, requirements or recognized disabilities that cannot use the public transport or that must uh, drive my car. We also have exemptions for, for those people with leadership mobility. These exemptions are for door, those uh, cars. And also we have authorizations for periodic medical treatments for those because uh, most of the metropolitan uh, and also regional uh, hospitals uh, are in the Barcelona and Barcelona city and the surrounding municipalities. So we have uh, visitors from all the all the region and the metropolitan area 
And those visitors that are coming for medical treatments can also drive in uh, with this authorization. Then we face it also the business uh, sector. Uh, we give a grave period for replacement and those who can uh, buy a new uh, professional uh, vehicle like van and trucks uh, can ask for a grace period of replacement between the moment they uh, they do the the book and uh, for until they receive the new vehicle. We also have uh, exemptions for those professionals approaching the retirement age. Uh, those owners that are retiring within uh, the next five years uh, have an exemption and don't need to change their car and can, they can still use it and, and drive in the low emission zones. And we also um, did a list of a special vehicles like, like crowds um, or uh, filming trucks and uh, or some um, special vehicles for works and things like this that have an exemption uh, during uh, for the working inside the low emission zones. And also in a city like Wales, uh, we established it, uh, that those uh, repair workshops that are working on a specific vehicle can, can uh, drive it inside the low emission zones uh, with an authorization. We also established uh, a municipality, municipal authorization for different activities like trades, uh, filming activities uh, on something uh, similar. Uh, and of course, all emergency services, vehicles, and other essential services have an exemption and that does not, not be uh, necessary to be replaced and by new ones. And I think it was uh, a note uh, informative for you and I'm glad to ask as much as questions that you have and if please uh, don't hesitate to contact me later if you want more specific information. Thank you Jordi. It's a very interesting presentation. <clears throat> I really like also that you are talking about the metropolitan area of Barcelona. <clears throat> so we are usually thinking about Barcelona in terms of the city and the city core that we know uh, when visiting as tourists. But really when we talk about the metropolitan area, the context is very, very different from what we know as tourists in the core of the city versus the other cities surrounding it. So I wonder, you talked about how you have been implementing all of these other incentives to use different um, forms of transportation alternatives to the car. And I wonder what the difference was between that city center in which usually people, you have a very high percentage of people walking versus those that were in cities outside. Did you see actually an increase of people um, riding bikes or taking other forms of mobility and transport? Well, um, there is a small difference, but it's not the very big one because uh, Barcelona city represent around, uh, 1.25 million people from these 3.2 people that uh, we are in these 36 municipalities. But the surrounding municipalities like uh, L'Hospitalet, Badalona, mm. and uh, all this, uh, there is a continuous uh, city. So you have uh, one sidewalk is one municipality and the fr in front uh, of you, you have the other one. So this is not big, very big difference in the core of this uh, municipality. Uh, if you have visited Barcelona, uh, probably you are visiting the, the, the Barcelona city center, but we will probably uh, be in a hotel on, the, on one of the other municipalities we have uh, near. Mm -hmm to Barcelona. Also, Fira of Barcelona, the trade uh, space is in L'Hospitalet, that it's uh, near. The airport is in El Prat, it's another municipality. So we are very, very um, uh, concentrated city. So uh, we have a, a public operator uh, from the Barcelona Tomate Le Mar Maria, that's the TMB, that it operates the Barcelona main Barcelona city. We have the several uh, operators for the other uh, surrounding uh, services. Uh, we work at uh, what we focused was 
to improve uh, those uh, services that were uh, less uh, focused before the implementation of the low emission zones in order to eliminate this difference between the very specific center and some mm. uh, metropolitan surroundings. But uh, we have a very, very uh, important network of buses and uh, underground uh, covering the main part of uh, this metropolitan uh, area. Thank you, Jordi. And I see that we have two questions. Um, Tricia, would you like to say your question out loud or would you like me to read it for you? Uh, in general, ah, perfect, we will allow you to talk. Uh, were the business privacy and residents in favor of anyone? Well, uh, that yeah. was what I was trying to explain. Uh, of one of their achievements. Uh, of course, business and private sector and residents were at the beginning against of the implementation of low emission zones. Nobody wants to restrict their uh, mobility and uh, usual uh, movements. Uh, we convinced them explaining and talking always on uh, health. We need to work uh, on this because we are uh, well, <clears throat> we are being uh, in a pollution uh, area. The pollution uh, kills us, and that was the specific and only message that we talked before the implementation and during uh, the implementation. We are still talking about uh, this uh, health uh, communication campaign because we are doing this not for uh, um, a better traffic management, not for better safety mobility. We are doing this for health uh, reasons. That's the main uh, situation. And most of the, the citizens uh, um, uh, supported the implementation of the low emission zones and most of them uh, say that they were not affected directly or on their mainly daily uh, movements and a uh, main part of those that were affected uh, changed their habits uh, uh, buying a new vehicle or uh, going to um, the public transport network and uh, working cycling on other sustainable modes. Uh, thank you, Jordi. That's really um, interesting to hear and to, uh, I know that it, uh, it was very impressive in your presentations, how you had the very specific incentives that you have, you know, by, by sector uh, for this initiative. And I just, just, just a quick follow up to that. Um, how did you, when you said, you, you know, you were contacting citizens and businesses, how did you do that? Um, was that mostly online or did you have kind of town hall meetings or was it on the, on the street with clipboards? I imagine it was a little bit of everything, but it would be interesting to know kind of the, the, the pragmatic part of that. Like, how did you actually do that outreach, particularly to citizens, but also in the, in the business sector, which I guess is a bit easier. would be interested to know. Thank you. Yeah. From uh, from the citizens uh, and residents side, uh, it was all on media. We worked a lot with uh, press. Uh, what we did were first was to sit uh, the main press uh, editors and explain them what was the low emission zones, what will be their characteristics, and why we were doing that. Uh, and we worked hard on this. And then from the business side and other uh, specific sectors, we, uh, we contact uh, different associations and uh, mm. representative sectors, and we sit with them on a table and we talk it about what will be the low emission zones, which were our expectative or what ideas on what we wanted to do and we negotiated with them uh, the situation. And that's why we get these different kind of authorization and exceptions was the result of this negotiation. Thank you, Thank Jordi. Thank you, Jordi. And I think it's very interesting how you reframed um, what the low emission zones are in the sense of how you communicated to people. 
because we're usually talking about we want to reduce emissions, reduce emissions, but what does that really mean to the person that is commuting every day? So when you frame it as health, I think it becomes a lot more approachable and a lot more pertinent for people to really embrace um, this type of initiative. And we have another question um, from Jenny Chen. Jenny, um, you're allowed to speak it out loud. If not, I can read your question. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And thank you for the presentation, Jordi. Um, just curious um, that if any of the um, lower emission zone uh, overlap with the super block initiative uh, that um, that promotes car freed um, blocked uh, in Barcelona. And uh, curious if there's any coordination between the two policies and initiatives and does it help uh, with the implementation um, of low emission zone to have car freedom initiative side by side uh, or beforehand, just um, curious. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, um, super blocks uh, and low emission zones are both uh, mobility uh, policies, but they are uh, independent and uh, separate policies. Are very related, but uh, one as the strategy of the Barcelona City Council and other uh, metropolitan municipalities strategy implementing super blocks. Uh, I think uh, Jacob talked uh, on the presentation before. Uh, there are uh, mainly uh, pedestrian zones or low traffic zones, uh, and the low emission zones are uh, wide areas of the city, uh, if not the whole city, where uh, we are restricting the circulation of the pollutant vehicles. Uh, vehicles can still circulate, but uh, must be non-pollutant. That's the difference between this, uh, the, the policies. Uh, they are, there is a very strong relation and one helps the other, because if you have a lot of super block uh, neighbors, uh, of course you will have less circulation. And if you have less circulation, you will have less pollution. Uh, but uh, it's not necessary to implement super blocks or have a super block strategy implementation in order to uh, implement the low emission zones. Uh, of course, the Barcelona City Council was very concerned about pollution, and that's why they uh, implemented the super blocks and also uh, pushed the uh, political agreement with the other metropolitan municipalities, the metropolitan government, and also the regional government to implement the low emission zones. But uh, it's not a very direct uh, relation or cause effect uh, between these two. Thank you, Jordi. And now I'm happy to present from the World Resources Institute, Lydia, Lydia Henderson, Research Associate on the Electric Mobility Team, and Hamilton Steimer, Research Analyst for WRI's Electric School Bus Initiative. Um, they published a paper, Zero Emission Delivery Zones, Decarbonizing Urban Freight and Goods Delivery in US Cities, which I really enjoyed reading as well. Not only it describes the potential to address the negative impacts of the increase we see because of urban freight and delivery vehicles, but it also talks about equity implications and invites cities to prioritize equity at every step. So I'll give the floor to Lydia and Hamilton. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, Good morning, good afternoon to all. I'll kick off the presentation and then pass it off to Hamilton. Today speaking on the paper Susanna just described and also a quick overview of WRI's work for those who might not be familiar. Um, and just a background on myself, um, I am a research associate on WRI's global electric mobility team. Um, we'll be presenting with Hamilton Steimer is also part of our e-mobility work. Uh, World Resources Institute is a global research organization, and we work in a number of different topic areas, food, forests, water, energy, climate, ocean, and cities in a number of regions, um, as you can see on the map displayed here. Um, our work is very targeted and working directly with cities, with both public and private stakeholders in all these regions, um, dedicated to shaping a future where cities work better for everyone. 
Um, only missing offices here would be Columbia, which was recently launched um, as our newest office. Uh, our key areas of focus under our electric mobility work um, relate to fleet electrification, advancing sustainable models and frameworks such as the avoid, shift, improve model, um, and a number of technical and planning interventions to advance safer, cleaner, and more sustainable transport modes for all. Um, some of our notable work um, is what Hamilton will present today. We also focus heavily on transit bus electrification, as well as our electric school bus initiative, working to electrify all of the U.S. school bus fleet. Um, WRI has been working closely with the UPS Foundation for several years to address challenges and considerations for fleet operators in the electrification transition, um, and I'll just pass it off to Hamilton to sort of dive deeper into that specific work. Thanks, Lydia. Um, so this paper was published in November 2022, so it's been around for a couple of months now. We've gotten a lot of activity, so it's great to, uh, an interest. So it's great to see that um, you know cities and other stakeholders are taking an interest to this kind of policy in the U.S. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to highlight that we'll get more in depth into is about the equity focus of this paper. Um, this is something that WRI really prioritizes in all of our work, um, and I'll get into more details um, later in the presentation. And just really quickly um, to kind of go through the structure of the paper itself, it kind of goes into some of the main freight and delivery externalities that, uh, that are common, um, the different types of ZZs that we discuss, uh, comparable policies and lessons learned and how they can inform ZZ planning, um, different types of real world ZZs that are underway, um, as well as kind of our general recommendations for city policymakers. And last thing I'll mention here before the uh, next slide is, uh, you know, the QR code is right there. So if you'd like to, um, you know, access the report, you can scan that um, and pull it up yourself. Next slide, please. So what are ZZs? We, we take a really um, kind of general broad definition here. So we define a ZZ as a designated area that permits unrestricted access to only zero emission delivery vehicles. Um, so the different types here, can, you can see in this table that we discussed in the paper, so voluntary restricted access area, um, you know, obviously this is an area where, uh, you know, it's, it's voluntary, you know, you can choose whether or not to participate in the ZZ, um, but you're not penalized for not doing so. Um, as a micro hub is a, a targeted more that last uh, mile deliveries, that's a drop off pickup point um, set near the final delivery area. A, a ZEV parking spots and loading zones, those are uh, much smaller, more targeted policy tools. Um, and then lastly, the mandatory restricted access zone. This is more of kind of what we're talking about, more related to the LEZs in the way where you have a large area where um, you have the PFV or are prohibited from um, accessing an area. And so uh, we have two reasons here. There's only really three, I suppose, for why a city might pursue a ZZ. You know, one being you know, wanting to reduce the negative impacts from the delivery sector. This is something that a lot of cities have prioritized over the years. Um, also, a ZZ could be a precursor policy to a larger zero emission uh, zone area. Um, and thirdly, you know, obviously trying to advance that um, mostly medium heavy duty uh, uh, vehicle market, you know, uh, the light duty vehicles, uh, electrification has progressed a lot more quickly than the sector. So this is another means of kind of encouraging um, that medium heavy duty uh, vehicle adoption uh, for zero emission vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things we wanted to talk about is, you know, there's not a lot of data out there on the effectiveness of ZZ just because they haven't really been implemented. They're kind of in that uh, initial stage. Um, so we thought it'd be useful to kind of take a look at, you know, what are some lessons learned from other policies that may be able to inform ZZ policy planning. Um, so we focus just on three, but we acknowledge there's a lot of other policies that could be applicable. So we look at, um, off-peak delivery, uh, uh, off delivery programs, uh, low emission zones, as well as congestion pricing. Um, so on the picture here on the right is an image of New York's uh, off-peak delivery policy areas that's take place in kind of that man lower Manhattan area as well as part of Brooklyn. Um, we get some detail in the paper that you can read. Um, and so three, three of the main takeaways I just wanted to highlight, which, which is that locally nationally coordinated ZZ schemes could have different effects. Um, so one of the things we noticed when we're kind of looking into these policies is that, you know, a local scheme, especially like a low emission zone, might be better tailored to kind of deal with the local market uh, that it's trying to impact. 
whereas a more nationally focused scheme uh, might help create more uniformity and less confusion for impacted actors um, who may cross markets between different cities. So that's one thing to think about. Uh, another is that city governments must be wary of costs and stakeholders. You know, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of different um, uh, drivers behind trying to pursue this policy. Um, so you need to be kind of wary and understanding of, you know, hey, we imp imp implement this policy, you know, what are the potential negative consequences? You know, is there anything that we can do to uh, you know, prevent that while also make sure this policy itself is strong? Um, and that kind of goes into that third point, which is, you know, poorly planned equity measures might compromise effectiveness. Um, you know, some policies such as congestion zones and low emission zones, or um, they might, you know, uh, distribute exemptions or, or temporary exemptions for the policy so that people have time to transition to other vehicles. Um, you want to make sure that you're not obviously giving out so many exemptions that no one's impacted. Um, you want to make sure you're thinking about kind of balancing that effectiveness requirement as well as that equity uh, requirement. Uh, next slide, please. And so one of the cities we talk about, uh, we talk about you know, Rotterdam, Seattle, uh, Rotterdam being one of the first to pursue ZZs and then kind of when the US focus focusing on uh, Seattle, Los Angeles and Santa Monica. Um, so I just wanted to highlight the Los Angeles example here. Um, you know, they're a C40 cities member and they've committed to implementing a zero emission area by 2030. Um, in 2021, they implemented a policy uh, deploying five zero emission, zero emission commercial loading zones throughout the city. Um, these zones were placed uh, based on, uh, you know, areas that had high delivery traffic as well as uh, high emissions. And so uh, some of the key features I just wanted to mention is that this was a very affordable policy. Um, I believe it, uh, it was only $2,000 per commercial loading zone. Um, the second one that I think is really important, this is an enforceable policy. Um, so for the U.S., you know, we don't have a national policy with you know, zero emission loading zones or zero emission zones or low emission zones. Um, part of the challenge in the U.S. is you know, the freight sector is uh, heavily protected and regulated. You know, cities, uh, it's really challenging for cities to go about trying to ban freight access. You know, for example, there's, you know, we, we identify in the paper, like one example is that in California, there's an explicit statute that says, you know, you really can't be banning uh, access of uh, freight delivery vehicles. Um, so this policy is, you know, what is something that cities do have control over? Well, they have control of the curb space. Um, so that, that's how they're able to, you know, they can ban access to the curb space, which is why they took this approach. Um, and lastly, it was an equity focus, as I mentioned. You know, it's something that was tailored, uh, you know, it's distributed policy. It was tailored toward areas that had that high uh, delivery activity as well as the high emissions. You know, they were really prioritizing trying to produce air quality benefits in areas throughout the city. Um, that previously we're having for air quality. Um, and one last thing I want to mention is that, you know, this is a, as I said, it's, you know, it's affordable, it's enforceable, you know, it's equity focused. Um, you know, with it being distributed, you know, it's something that at the, at the moment, you know, the impacts uh, system-wide, you know, are slightly minimal just because there are only five commercial loading zones. However, you know, the, with this policy, the city, depending on its policy priorities, could scale up the policy, you know, distributing more of these throughout the city, um, which in effect, you know, if you have every, you know, commercial, every commercial loading zone being a zero emission commercial loading zone, it could create an effect that effectives that C. Um, so something to think about the kind of a creative, innovative approach um, of US city having to take. Uh, next slide, please. And so we conclude with some recommendations for policymakers, um, you know, engaging stakeholders early and often, you know, figuring out who your champions and opposition as you go about this, um, taking a stepwise approach and building up to a ZZ. Um, you know, this could look like, as I mentioned, you know, this could be implementing supportive policies like low emission zones or congestion pricing. Um, or if you want to take a smaller approach, you could be implementing something like a zero emission commercial loading zone. Um, where you can kind of pilot the idea and then slowly scale up um, depending on your policy priorities. Uh, thirdly, providing supportive policies for successful and inclusive ZZs. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about in the paper is, you know, obviously you're trying to prioritize that environmental equity, making sure that you know, these communities that are heavily polluted receive those air quality benefits. We also know this is an economic challenge where, you know, um, you know zero emission vehicles themselves are very expensive and hard uh, you know, for most fleets to acquire, you know, how can we go about doing a policy in a way that, you know, meets those needs and make sure we're not putting an undue burden on those communities that we're trying to help. 
um, you know, could that be other types of uh, incentives to maybe make it easier to make that transition to zero emission vehicles? Uh, fourthly, you know, pursuing state and federal policy reform. You know, this is something that is more of a challenge, you know, especially on the federal policy side, but uh, maybe at the state level thinking about uh, pursuing this policy to help promote uniformity uh, between the different zero emission policies, uh, as well as also implementing that um, different incentives to help with the fleet transition. And lastly, you know, obviously you need to prioritize equity at every step along the process. Um, as I mentioned, there are some potential negative consequences you need to think about. Um, so making sure that you're advancing that social and economic equity along the way is really important. And I'll hand off to Lydia real quick to close us out. Yes, thank you, Hamilton. Uh, just a quick sort of teaser uh, to illustrate what WRI is working on right now. We are continuing to work with the UPS Foundation to investigate the relationship between cities and freight, uh, scaling back from just looking at zero emission delivery zones, but other examples of low or zero emission zones. And my colleague, Jenny Chen, who's on this call, is building out what is essentially a database of committed, planned, and implemented examples of zero, low, and zero emission delivery zone examples around the world, um, expanding from Netherlands and North America to focus on other newer examples in Latin America, India, China, Indonesia, and a number of other countries. Uh, we are hoping to investigate patterns of implementation as more and more cities are signing declarations committing to eventual low emission and eventual zero emission uh, policies, as well as leading financial incentives, leading sort of co-policies that cities are using and also the physical formats of these zones and the populations they are affecting. And we're hoping to conclude with you know, further recommendations and considerations for freight operators as they continue to work in areas where cities are, again, more and more likely to adopt these types of policies. And that overlap, as you know, Jacob and Jordy were describing, of how LEZs and ZEZs affect broader urbanization goals um, and broader mobility goals. So just a plug again for our, our work, it should be published later in this year, and we are seeking external reviewers and folks who may be interested in being interviewed for our research. So if that sounds interesting to you, please reach out to us. We may also do some follow-ups after this call. That's all we Thank have. you, Lydia and Hamilton. That was a great presentation. And just because we have a couple of minutes left, I would like to do um, one last question from the audience. I see, Pedro, um, that you have a question um, just for the sake of time. I'm going to read it really fast. I'm curious if C, um, zero emission delivery zones would only be for electric or also available for PHEV cars. Um, so I know most of our paper, we, you know, we focus kind of on the electric side of things, but you know, obviously this could take different forms, such as fuel cells, it could be uh, using bikes or... Uh, I know a lot of cities also that include PHEVs in their definition of zero emission vehicles. So, you know, that's something where it's going to be up to the policymakers and what they want to have uh, qualify as a zero emission vehicle. So, um, you know, if a city wanted to do that, they very well could have those vehicles included in that definition. Great. Thank you very much. And you will see in the chat that we have included the links both to the report from ITDP and to the white paper from WRI. And we will include now the link to the series on um, mobility sessions that we have been doing in case you want to watch this recording or the past ones um, and see what the upcoming webinar will be. And um, last but not least, we would love to get your feedback. So if you can answer a very quick feed, uh, survey of like two minutes to know how we can do better so that you take the most out of these sessions, um, we would really appreciate it. And I would just like to thank again, all of our panelists, Jacob, Hamilton, Lydia, Jordi, for these um, insights and for being willing to share your knowledge and expertise with all of us. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.